All right. Do you know how to copy the links? Do you know how to do that here? Live. There's probably the spare thing. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, copy the links. No, where is that? Links? I think Mike, I think, yeah, I think I got oh, my computer. I got it. Yeah. We're gonna put this out real quick. Probably the links. How bad is the latency? Someone wave their hand there. That seems really slow. Stream to the live feed will be delayed. Not sure. Maybe you. All right. Can you see me? Yep. All right. all sort of odd audio. So I think everybody knows you. There's okay. Craig Stark. I'm going to sit down and mute our audio. All righty. I think Mike, you may be running up to the, the live one on your computer. That's causing a video, I think. What's that? You may be running a live on the other one. Yeah, there are definitely multiple mics live there, or so, or at least one. So this, this, this is maybe you broadcasting, or you may frame up the broadcast part of the song, isn't it? Uh, well, wait a minute. All of the crazy stuff has gone away. I hear myself echoing, but that's about it. All right. How's that? Are we good? I'm good. Are you good? I'm good. You can hear me. I can hear you. Can hear you. All right. There we go. We have a video link and we're live streaming. Right, let me do the most important thing. Get out of the way. We're delighted to have Craig Stark with us tonight. He's uh, been the great soul, and he's not studying the inner working of the human brain to try and figure out the inner workings of astrophotography. I'll have to ask you which one is harder. Clearly, guiding was a tough one, but he cracked that out for us with PhD. And tonight, we're going to learn more about uh, Nebulosity 4. So with that, I'll turn it over to Craig. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction there. And it's uh, really fun to be back talking to the group. Um, so. Last time when I talked to you, I talked about a couple different things. I talked about, you know, what is signal to noise? How do we go about trying to get some things in the data? I also talked a good bit about um, how do we go through, like, what what actually is happening in pre-processing of the data? And when doing that, I gave a little bit of a demo of uh, some of the stuff inside of of Nebulosity. And what I wanted to do um, today, though, was to try to actually share a little bit more in terms of what I have been doing in, in Nebulosity. And it's a great opportunity also for me to find out what are the kinds of things that, that people really want. Because I started this now ages ago, like, oh, I don't know, 12, 14 or so years ago now, I started this as an attempt to try to actually get some software that I would want to use. Because this was back in back in the day in which you could buy an SBIG, um, or you could buy an SBIG, or I think you could buy an SBIG. And that was about it in terms of uh, the players out there. There were a couple others, but not very many. Um, but the long exposure webcams had really just started to hit. So Steve Chambers and crew, you know, had figured out how you could take a Philips Vesta webcam and a soldering iron and a chip. You could hack this webcam to take long exposure shots. 
And I had just started to try to revive my telescope, dust it off, get it set up, figure out how the heck do you like polar align, which one is Polaris, all that kind of great stuff again. Um, this is before GoTo, and, or at least I didn't have GoTo and all this sort of thing. But in any case, I, I took my first images, and then I stared at these things, and I could see that there was something in the individual frames. Um, but for the life of me, I couldn't figure out a really easy way to start doing all of the pre-processing, to start doing the stacking, to do the stretching and everything. There was an early version of Maxim that was out there that even at the time cost a whole bunch of money. Uh, there was Iris, which was a full command line driven sort of thing. And um, yeah, that was about it at the time. And so I started to write something with the idea of trying to have something be an easy to use application that I would want to use because I know when I go out and I image, I'm tired. By the time everything is set up, I may be frustrated, I may be tired, I'm, I'm not at my best cognitively. And so try to make something that's nice and simple and easy to use and yet at the same time is a stickler for accuracy because you know, uh, as was mentioned, I'm I'm a scientist. I try to figure out how the brain works. I stick people inside of MRI machines, and when I take these pictures of people's brains with the activity on them, they're these really really noisy pictures. But buried inside this noise is little blips of activity in different spots of your brain, and so we take a whole bunch of pictures because they're so noisy. And we have to then go and, well, people's heads move a little bit inside the scanner, so we have to register all the images on top of each other and stack them up and be able to pull out the little bits of actual signal and all this noise. And, of course, that's the same exact thing we do in astrophotography. So there was this notion that this is, in fact, the same kind of thing. Um, so I wrote Nebulosity then to try to give a nice uh, interface of this kind of thing. It's now on version 4. And so I've added a bunch of new things in here. Now, can you guys see me anymore? Yeah. Nod up and down if you can. You're perfect. I'm perfect. OK. Um, so let me try to take you through a little bit of this. Now, one of the things I can actually show you here, let me see if I can uh, um, <coughs> uh, So there's one demo I had set up. So, okay, I just checked right now, and Nebulosity is currently 112,000 lines worth of code. So it's grown a lot over the, uh, over the years. Um, but let me try showing you some of the things that we've got going on here now. So last time we went, we went through pre-processing. Um, I don't know that I went through alignment, so let me just kind of quickly show you what some of these things actually look like. Now, are you seeing, hopefully, a uh, Nebulosity window? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, this is a nice image of the uh, the Crescent Nebula that I captured some time ago. As I say a, a stack here. And we're going to be coming back to this. Um, one of the things that I make people do as they align uh, their images is I make people actually go through and um, go through and take a look at each and every frame. Now, I know a lot of packages will go through and you can say, hey, look, uh, I'm just going to select, for example, um, let me just grab a stack of frames right here. Let me see if I can see exactly what you're seeing. Um, minimize this here. So I make people go through, there we go. Okay, I make people go through and take a look at each and every frame. This is a nice shot, actually, of uh, the horse head and uh, M42 there. Take a look at each frame and tell me, you know, do you want to align this frame, yes or no? And the way you tell me is you stick a little uh, crosshair on here and you say, yes, that's, the, fr that's uh, the star I want you to line on. Now, one of the things that I see you are not seeing you probably don't see this little tiny window that's floating on top. Okay, let me just do quick, one quick other thing in terms of the sharing. Let me share my whole screen with you so you can at least get this. Okay, so one of the things that's always been in Nebulosity is this notion that you click on the star saying, hey, look, this is the one that I want. 
And you can go through, you can click on each frame and say, yes, that's the one I like, that's the one I like, that's the one I like. Um, you can go through and say, if you notice on the bottom of the screen here, it says Alt-click to say, yeah, keep all of them. You can do this little command click to say, okay, yes, I'll click anywhere, not on the star, but it says keep your guess as to where the star is. You can say, hey, look, this one here actually has a um, plane that went through it. So I can say, no, I don't want this one. You can go through. But what I want you to be doing here is actually taking a look at your raw data, because there's a great phrase, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't know what's inside here, you just say, yeah, 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 I'm sure everything is fine. Your end result is not necessarily going to look all that great. So this sort of interface has been here since pH, sorry, since Nebulosity 1.0, but this little window here is brand new. What this little window shows is it's actually listing every single one of your images. And remember that one that I said the plane was going through? It checked here saying, oh yeah, this is one that you told me to skip. So if I can want, I can go through here and I can say, yes, I want to use this one. Yes, I want to use this one. For some reason, I don't particularly like this one. No, I'll skip it. And so now you can see that it's, in fact, got a little check mark to say, okay, this one also is one to skip. But you can go back and say, no, 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 I didn't mean to skip that. Let me put that back in. So the nice thing about this now is that you can actually go through ones you've already aligned on and say, wait a minute, did I click on the right star? Is that the right thing? I seem to think that there was a frame in the middle here that wasn't all that good. You can now go through and sort of revise your entries. In addition, you can also say, hey, you know what? I really like this frame. For some reason, I want to call this the reference frame. And now everything will be aligned to this frame instead of aligning to a central tendency frame. Now, the nice thing about that is let's say that you are shooting something with a bunch of different filters. Maybe you're doing LRGB imaging. And you now want to be able to go through and say, hey, I want the luminance to be my template. And I want to align all of these color frames to that luminance. You just flag the luminance one as your reference frame there. And now, hey, everything is lined exactly on that. So everything will stack exactly on top of it. All right, but when you know you've got the frames you want, you finish through the list there, it runs through, it says, hey, what do you want to call this? We'll call it the average stack V0 here, and boom, I've gone and I've aligned my shots. Now, you've probably noticed right on here that, let me in fact make sure that it's clear by sharing just this window. Let's get you this. Now, one thing that you can see on here, of course, is that there are a whole bunch of little hot pixel trails. This comes uh, by the fact that I didn't actually even do anything in the way of dark subtraction on these frames, and so I've got a whole bunch of hot pixels that are scattered across my image here, and this pretty much looks like crud. Now, last time I'd gone over a standard technique that uh, imagers use to try to actually get rid of these kinds of things, and that technique is uh, called sigma clipping or standard deviation based combining. And in this method here, what happens is you go through every single pixel after you've aligned it, you go through each value that you have for that pixel and you say, hey, do these values look reasonable or is there one that seems to be an outlier? So let me make this uh, kind of clear for folks here. What I've got up right now here on the screen, let's make it a little bigger so everyone can see, is this notion of the bell curve. You've probably heard of this. It's the normal distribution. A lot of things follow a bell curve. Height follows a bell curve. All sorts of things follow it. You expect that if you grab some sample, if we took some little spot in the sky in a nebula, it may be at a value of 1,000 coming off your CCD. But each time you measure it, it's going to vary a little bit. 990, 1,010, 987, 1,043, but all of your values would fall along this curve. Things that don't fall along this curve, we can say are probably errors. What I'm showing over on the right here with these little blue plus signs, these are samples of the intensity value you may have, and the one here on top of each one of these is an outlier. It's wrong. It didn't come from this underlying distribution. And what sigma clipping or standard deviation based stacking does is it goes through and says, okay, look, I'm going to 
take a look at the average that you came up with of all of the values across all of your images for that pixel, and I'm going to say, hey, are you outside of one and a half or two or two and a half standard deviations? One standard deviation gives you 68% of the expected data, two standard deviations, um, uh, 95%, etc. The problem with this kind of thing is that when it's coming up with how variable are things, it's coming up with that based upon your own data that includes those outliers. And so if you've ever used this sigma clipping or standard deviation based combining, one of the things that you can see sometimes is that it actually goes and leaves, it takes out a lot of these things, but it can still leave a few of them behind. So one of the things that I added recently into uh, Nebulosity 4 is a new kind of uh, thresholding, a new kind of way of coming up with, hey, which ones do we think are bad? And it's a really, really simple scheme. It comes down to percentiles. So if you had 10 images and you said, okay, I'm going to lop off, I'm only going to use the 10th to the 90th percentile. What I do internally is I go through and I say for every little pixel here that's been lined up, let me rank order the values and let me throw away the bottom 10% and the top 10%. So the very darkest and the very brightest. Let me throw those away and now calculate my average based on the ones that are just in the middle there. So you can be even more vindictive and say the 20th to the 80th percentile or the 30th to the 70th percentile or the 40th to the 60th and in each one of these then you're throwing away more and more of your data. By the way, if you've ever used a median combine in another package, that's really the 50th percentile. You're only taking the one value that's in the middle and you're throwing everything else away. That's really, really good at being able to toss away things like bright spots of airplanes, of hot pixels, of elongated stars, but at the same time you're also throwing away a lot of good data that helps you get rid of all of that noise. So it's actually not the most effective thing to do to do median based combining. You want to throw away everything you need to and nothing more. So with these percentile based stacking routines you can quickly go through and say hey let's kind of see what one of these things look like. So let's just take these same bits of data here and we'll go through, we'll open these guys up, and, oh, wait a second. This is not going to work at all because the first step that you have to do is go through and align them. So right now, it's actually going to be very interesting to see what this does. I have no idea what this is going to do. It's probably going to throw away, oh, this is going to be really interesting. I'm very curious to see what it actually does. That's yeah, not ideal at all. Okay, so let's go through and actually do it on the right data. The first step in any one of these more advanced things is to go through and actually um, go through and actually do the alignment, saving each frame after the alignment. So let me take the ones that have been already aligned here and go through and tell it to do this. If you notice now, this is no longer moving from frame to frame. There was my uh, airplane going through. So it's loading them all up, it's now going and doing the math on them, it's figured it out. And now when we take a look at this, oh, there is a wonderfully nice frame. Let me zoom all the way in here. Just to give you an idea as to the kind of thing that this can do, let's load up Nebulosity's little uh, preview tool here. And let's take a look in. We'll take our average, we'll do our standard deviation based, and we'll use the percentile based. Alrighty, so let me lock this one here. Here's our simple average, and as you can see, of course, there are a huge number of these hot pixel trails. Let me come on down to the spot where I happen to know there was something. So here's our average, and of course, if we blink, we see that all those go away. But if we even take a look at, here's this standard deviation base combined. And can you see right here? This, in fact, is a uh, um, hot pixel trail that did not come out with the uh, standard deviation base clipping. Here's another little one right here. And we can see that it very, very nicely goes away with this other style of, uh, um, this other style of combining. A nice benefit of this is it also does a very good job of taking out black spots, black pixels. 
So whether it's a bright pixel trail, whether it's a black pixel trail, doesn't really matter. It's going to go away. And in addition, if you have some frames that have elongated stars and other frames, most of them that are nice and round, the elongation is going to go away as well. So that's a, a very fun kind of thing. Oh, let me see if I can actually. OK, let me see if I can zoom in enough to have you actually see this. Let's take a look then at these stars. And let's blink this here. See how we're going in between round stars and uh, oblong stars? So that's the effect I was talking about right there. The ability to then go and say, since most of the frames have nice round stars, but some of them are elongated, we throw away just the elongated samples, and we keep the others. So by the way, I'm not hearing you at all. Are there questions on any of this? Can I uh, hear and get questions? I see that you guys are muted right now. All right, well, I'll assume then that there are no questions on that. But please, if there are, I can't see you okay. raise your hand. Um, if there are, yeah. We just took the mute off, so now we can ask questions. Excellent. I was just a little curious how, how you took those images. It looks like maybe you've got some flexure between the, the, uh, the guiding camera and the, and the imager. Or do you know how that works? Oh, it's show you a little later, but so, actually I didn't take it with this, but I took it before I had this. And what this is here, this is my QSI camera, and this is a Pentax medium format lens. Now this Pentax medium format lens has a little tiny shoe right there, um, which as you can see is not all that sturdy. I had my guide rig, this Borg, mounted just on that shoe, and as, of course, it was going all night and everything like that, it flexed like crazy and it moved a lot. But it serves as a really nice demonstration of the kind of flexure and kind of problems that you can actually deal with. In the end, the shot comes out nice because we have ways of actually dealing with that. But yeah, that's why we have that, uh, that massive drift between the frames there. Of course, if you do things like dither, you induce that sort of drift. If you just have really, really crummy mounts for your gear there, you automatically get dither, and you don't need to go to extensive uh, ends to actually get it yourself. Are you able to hear us now? Yep, I got you right now. OK, good. Are there other questions at this point? Anybody? No. No. All right. So. Let me show you a couple other things here in this, in terms of uh, um, stuff that's gone on and stuff that uh, I don't know if people have used it before. Some of the things in here that you know I do uh, that are a little same or a little bit different. Um, if we take this percentile-based image here, and let me do screen share and give you my whole screen again. So if we take this image here. You know, one of the standard things, of course, that you want to be able to do in any uh, uh, piece of software is to be able to go through and actually do um, some kind of stretching. Because right now, you can see that, yes, in fact, there's a horse head, and then there's an M42, and all this kind of thing. Um, if you notice, my sliders are set, you know, so that I'm only looking at the data from 0 to 2,000 in the actual intensity. My true raw data looks like this. This is what the stack looks like. And of course, the whole point that we're going through in all of this is to try to take these very, very faint bits. So here's the histogram of the uh, data. To take these very, very faint bits and stretch them so that you can start to see them. And in Nebulosity, we have a standard levels tool, which is what I'm playing with right now, as a way of doing this. And this is the same exact math that's being done inside of Photoshop when you run their levels tool. I talk about power. They talk about level. One is just the reciprocal of the other. It's the absolute same exact math. So you can go through and you can use this kind of thing, just like in any sort of package. You've got a uh, standard level sort of deal. So we can start to see a nice non-blown out M42 coming through, and there's a horse head coming through, et cetera. And you can play this kind of game, and you get certain kinds of stretches by doing this, uh, this kind of thing. But OK, there's a reasonable looking shot and everything of uh, uh, of this. Um, we also have a couple of other tools that you uh, get to use if you want to try. One is called uh, Digital Development Processing, or DDP. 
DDP was originally designed to make our CCDs look more like analog film. And DDP is kind of like the astrophotographer's heroin or crack here. Um, you saw I had to spend a couple minutes iterating, going through levels. Oh, let me do this level here. Let me reset the black point. Let me slide it here, set the black point, back and forth and back and forth. I just fired up the DDP tool. I slid the crossover slider to, oh, I don't know, down a little from where it was. And all of a sudden, I actually have a pretty reasonable looking shot here of this Orion Nebula. Uh, maybe I go and I adjust the background, or there's this background power slider you can adjust. Uh, it was too much. But in any case, uh, kind of one-stop shopping, um, yeah, that's a pretty darn reasonable looking stretch and everything of it to begin with. DDP works very, very well for some images, works absolutely horribly for other images. Uh, give it a shot and see what you actually think on it. Of course, we have full undo in here as well. And then finally, let me just kind of show that, yes, in fact, there are curves in here. Um, I like giving you control, but at the same time, I like keeping you, um, well, from getting in too much trouble. So the curves tool that I have lets you draw a family of curves called a bezier. And so you should be able to see on here, you can draw all these little sigmoids. You take these little control points, and you can slide these guys around and get all sorts of different stretches. So we could do something like this. We could have Warren Keller's favorite pet stretch. And in any of these, you can go through and you can say, OK, yes, that's fine. Now let me go. Let me uh, call it up again. And you can, again, do this sort of iterative kind of thing. If you happen to like the last curve you did, it remembers that. And you can go through and you can iterate between curves and levels and do a whole bunch of powerful stretching. I did this intentionally, by the way, this Bezier curve, because if you notice, the curves that you can draw with this you can get some, if you really work it, you can get some fairly steep transitions. But you have to really work hard at it, and you can't go anywhere near as far astray as you can actually get in Photoshop. In Photoshop, you can try to come up with one curve to rule them all to do your entire stretch. And odds are that's not going to be the best way to do it. Um, in my experience, it's not. In folks like Tonya Hallis and Warren Keller and the gurus who actually teach this kind of thing, they all have you go through when you're doing things in uh, stuff like Photoshop and do multiple rounds worth of curves and levels to try to slowly dial things in. So, I mean, Tony talks about, you know, the initial steep and then this rise here to the end with the whole goal of trying to keep it so that, in fact, everything is going smoothly and you're not making any weird wonky transitions. Because who knows, maybe in some bright star over here, you're going to have that weird wonky transition and so it's going to make that star look strange. So in all of this kind of thing here, you are often better served by doing something like that. So we can see, in fact, I've got a pretty reasonable amount of, uh, of data here in this wide shot. It's kind of test shot I did a couple months ago of Orion's uh, using this, uh, this nice wide field kind of setup. All right, but I wanted to show people that that's actually in there. And I can also see that my camera does have a defect. I've got to take some new control frames and take these things out. The poor QSI now has that in there. All right, so that's the kind of thing that you can actually get in here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's got tools built in, just like other, any other sort of application, to be doing this kind of thing of stretching your data and trying to pull things out. There are lots of things that have been, I mean, these have been in there for a good long time. There are other things that have been in there for a good long time, um, uh, like noise reduction, adaptive median noise reduction, gray noise reduction. Um, and in each of these kinds of things, you can go through and you can say, OK, look, let me go set various thresholds. And it's setting the threshold as to where it's applying its noise reduction and all this kind of deal. The goal is to get it, as I say, so you can turn, you know, go from something, all of your basic shots, through all the pre-processing, through all the stacking, and into that kind of thing uh, that you may take into a final like paint program like Photoshop or GIMP or whatever you like to actually do the final cleanup kind of deal. All right, so let's just hit a couple other little bits here that have uh, um, uh, been added a little bit, uh, been tweaked or been added a little bit more recently. Um, LRGB uh, color synthesis has been in for a good long time, but it's recently been fixed up a bunch. One of the things I'm asked a whole, uh, asked a lot and uh, end up doing a number of talks on is the whole difference between monochrome and color cameras. Um, 
one of the huge perks of being able to have a monochrome camera is you get to do something called LRGB imaging. And since I've seen, uh, recognized a lot of the faces in the crowd there, I won't go through it in excruciating detail by any means, but the basic idea is that when you have a color camera, what you actually have is you have a single sensor that has red, green, or blue that's actually on every single, every single pixel here. And so if we take a look at uh, a standard color filter array here, you see that a monochrome sensor has clear filters over everything, and an RGB has red, green, or blue. There are slight different variations on this RGB theme here, including some now that have a clear, but the basic idea is the same here in that we're going and we're having a number of pixels that are coding for color only. What that means is that they're letting through a lot less light than you would actually have otherwise. In an absolute ideal world, each pixel would get 33% of the light that a clear pixel would get. And so your luminance one would be getting three times as much light. In a, an actual world, you get a lot less than that that's actually getting through, a lot closer to about 20% or so of the light coming through. These are actual curves generated from sensors showing that, okay, look, here are the kinds of things that you have on top. This is, happens to be a, a QSI 540 versus the 540C and you can see the curves for the red, green, and blue, and they're nowhere near getting up to the same kind of level, because these color filters, of course, have, have some loss. So the nice thing about LRGB imaging is you get to then go and take a nice big luminance frame to let all of your data come in, get a nice bright kind of thing, and you get to take some pretty crummy looking color data that you can then end up going through and actually coming up with a nice, very sharp color image in the end. So you have these kinds of tools in, in Nebulosity. Um, if you run an LRGB and I say, okay, look, let me go and take a look at um, the luminance data here. Let me, in fact, zoom this in so we can uh, uh, let me actually cancel here for a second. This is a shot of the crescent I took some time ago, and hopefully you can see in here that we have a pretty nice, sharp, image here of, uh, of these stars. You can tell I do a lot of wide field work. But if I go and say, okay, look, let's go do LRGB imaging. Here's the luminance frame. Tell it it's the luminance frame. Let me go and grab up the color frames here, the color data for this. You see how soft that is? It's really soft. It's really blurry because this has been binned. This has been smooth. This has been blurred. This has had all sorts of stuff to cut out any noise in here and make my color data look nice and smooth. But when you stick the luminance on top of the color, you get this. Again, it's nice, it's bright, it's sharp, and yet you have all the color that you had before. So the LRGB tool internally got a uh, um, bit of a reworking to try to actually clean up a number of things inside there. So that's actually working very, very nicely here. Now, a couple other things that we have inside here is uh, one of the brand new tools is an ability to actually deal with gradients in your images. So in all of our imaging, we always have some optical defects. We have dust motes on our sensor. We have vignetting. We have gradients of sky glow. We have all sorts of stuff that just, in the end, makes our data look a little bit crummy. Now, I'm going to show you here, in fact, this shot of the crescent. And hopefully what you can see here right now, let me go through and actually share just this window so you can see it well. It's a little odd having the infinite recursion of images here. Okay, so on the screen right now, hopefully what you can see, and I can maybe try to exaggerate it a bit here, is that the optical system I took this with, while I've gone through, and yes, I've done flats, for one reason or another, things weren't perfect. And we can see that the bright set, there's a brightness to the center and a clear fall off by the time it gets to the end. Now, a new tool that we have in here, I'll be able to show you the uh, difference in a quick little blink here. A new tool that I added in, does this, makes that gradient very, very nicely go away. So if we blink these guys here, actually the problem with blinking is it makes the inner look uh, look dark, it's not actually. Uh, we can see here now it very, very nicely makes this go away. 
And the way this works is through a simple little uh, uh, interface that you get to uh, pull up here. Let me just try to get it again so you'll be able to see it. Um, so let's open the one that actually has the vignette. So what, uh, what we have now inside here is we have a synthetic flat field tool. And I wrote this because I was really jealous. I was really jealous of the old tool inside of the free version of PixInsight um, that what it would do is you could load up your image and even built into the free tool that's now no longer available, you could go through and you could say, hey, here are some nice spots in the background of my image. Could you go and try to figure out what that background looks like and remove that from here? So I was really jealous of that tool. And finally, um, with the uh, help of another, uh, another programmer who started down the path, and then I sort of picked the baton up from there to go through and say, hey, look, let me go and try to actually uh, finish this out here. Um, what we came up with is a really nice tool that lets you go through and actually select the background in the image here. So this little synthetic flat field pops up, shows you a copy of your uh, image. And you can actually use up and down arrows to change the brightness. And you can go through, and right now it's come up with a little array of these on here. And you can say, no, I don't want this one, but maybe I'll put one here. And oh, for some reason I don't like this one. Whatever it may be, it's going to now go through and try to figure out. Oh, apparently I haven't. Uh, uh... So what happens, of course, when you run a development version of something in a live stream here? Um, it's going to go through, and it's going to try to figure out actually what the overall background is here and try to pull this out. Let me just try this here. Interesting. All right, so uh, in any case, I'll, I'll a little later on actually go and run the uh, full version of Nebulosity instead of this development one I happen to have running right now. Um, so in any case, the tool lets you go through, pick the spots, and then do that nice thing of being able to re either return the flat field for you, show it with the uh, field removed, and uh, um, it works very, very nicely. So that was a nice little tool that's been added into that. So questions on this bit uh, so far here? See anything? Oh. All right. So one of the other things that I wanted to do in, in version 4 here is to try to go through and try to actually get it so that there's a, there's a sort of broader world and broader uses of, uh, of the software. Because by this point, I've got a package that supports a huge number of cameras supports a bunch of cameras on the Mac that I had to write the drivers for a lot of them, supports a huge number of cameras on Windows, and it has all of the basic bits and pieces that, well, you'd really want to have in something to do with your standard sort of capture and pre-processing and stacking and trying to get things, get things ready for uh, your sort of final post-production kind of image. But one of the things that had been lacking was an ability to have, have it talk and play well with, with other programs. Now, already, Nebulosity has had the ability to go through and actually um, be scripted so that you can go through and you can say, hey, look, I want to create a little script. And what this script is going to do is it's going to go through and um, it's going to go through and capture things automatically and change the filter and capture something else and et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, that's still limited to within the Nebulosity realm. And there are a number of things out there that, well, a lot of people use. There are things like Astro Planner and all sorts of stuff that lets you truly automate an entire night worth of thing and will tell, oh, look, let's have it go to this and then take these things and shift the filter and go to that and all this kind of thing. And I figured I could reinvent that wheel or I could just try to make it so that Nebulosity is a lot easier for all those other packages to actually talk to. And I had as my target then packages that will do automation, and also what's quite probably the best autofocus package out there, Focus Max. I wanted to be able to have Nebulosity talk to Focus Max, and to do that, I set upon a several-month-long journey 
to rewrite a, a whole bunch of stuff inside here and get it so that Nebulosity could act as an ASCOM camera. Now, open a second desktop and slide. And slide in. Okay, so can you can you see this Windows Nebulosity thing here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. That's what I mean to be showing you. All right. So those of you in the Windows world know what ASCOM is because quite possibly in something like PHD, when you say connect to my mount, what you actually do is you connect to an ASCOM mount. In addition, some of you may actually be going and talking to your cameras through ASCOM. So in Nebulosity here, you can say, oh, look, I want to connect to an ASCOM camera. Wow. This is not my uh, my day here. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but apparently Nebula apparently ASCOM is not properly installed on this virtual machine. In any case, you can tell Nebulosity to connect to an ASCOM camera, and then it goes and connects whether it's your, you know, uh, QHY camera or something like that. It can connect to that just fine. Um, but what I ended up doing is I ended up writing stuff to make Nebulosity itself be an ASCOM camera. So right now. I'm inside Nebulosity in Windows, and I'm talking to its simulator. And so you can see here that this is the standard simulator kind of image. It respects things like you change the duration, and it'll make things brighter. It takes the amount of time it's supposed to take, and all this kind of deal. And you know that PHD can talk to ASCOM cameras. And so PHD has its own little simulator, and it looks like this. But I can tell PHD to connect to an ASCOM camera. And so if I tell it to connect to an ASCOM camera, and instead of something like, well, my Starlight Express or my QHY or whatever kind of thing, I have it talk to Nebulosity. What happens now is when I tell PHD to loop, it actually grabs the image from Nebulosity. Now, at the moment, what I'm demonstrating here is a very strange kind of thing because the only time you would ever need to do this is if Nebulosity supported some camera that ASCOM didn't support and you wanted to guide with that or something stupid like this. It's not really a high use kind of scenario. I mean, perhaps your Canon digital SLR or something like that, you could hook up a Nebulosity and you could try now. People have asked me, can I guide with my digital SLR? And this is now the way you could guide if you really wanted with your digital SLR. Please don't do it. Um, but the nice thing about it is ASCOM is a universal standard. So any package out there that knows how to control an ASCOM camera can now control Nebulosity. So all of the various planning packages out there where you can say, hey, I want you to do this and this and this and move my telescope to do that and do this and this and this, and at the same time, you maybe you want to use a camera that Nebulosity supports or you just want to use Nebulosity Connect the camera in Nebulosity, control Nebulosity with your other program, whether it's a planning program, whether it's your planetarium program that can also go through and do the captures, whether it's PhD guiding, whatever it is, anything that speaks ASCOM can now intimately control Nebulosity. And if you want, if you like programming, you can now control Nebulosity with whatever programming language you darn well feel like. You don't have to use the built-in scripting language inside of here. This happens to be a little Visual Basic script. And what this script does is it says, OK, look, connect to Nebulosity's camera, set the binning to be this, capture a little subframe, make it be one second long, save the image as a FITS file, and there we go. So anybody who wants to do their own kind of automation can do so much, much more easily now by virtue of having done this. It was a long, long road to do this. And a great thing that fell out of this is one of those other programs out there that really wants to talk to an ASCOM camera is Focus Max. And so now at least Windows users can go through and have the full power of Focus Max. It's automated capture. It's automated dealing with, oh, it's 2 AM, and I just changed my filter. And by the way, the temperature has changed. Please go autofocus now before you go and take your next set. All of that kind of stuff can be done uh, with Nebulosity now as well by virtue of having that kind of thing inside there. So that was a, uh, uh, a long and arduous process, but it's now something that's gotten it so that we have opened up a huge realm of external control to this.
One final little bit of external control, if anybody does happen to be interested in, in programming, is now there is a nice way also to have plugins for Nebulosity. Still have to talk to me a little bit in terms of getting in and out of here, but I now have built into, uh, um, built into Nebulosity the ability to go in and out of programs, for example, written in Python. Python is a very, very easy to uh, learn programming language, has some wonderful, wonderful tools baked into it with things like scientific Python. So if you have an idea that you want to do something like, well, synthetic flat fielding, or you want to do plate solving, that's another one that Emmanuel LaFosse and I are working on right now, or you want to do some other kind of image processing on this, there's now a very trivial way you can uh, um, tie in with Nebulosity to be able to actually do that. And it even works nicely around things like GPL licensing and all that kind of thing. So that was another nice little feature that, uh, that I added in at, uh, uh, with Nebulosity 4. All right, questions here at this point. Are you still actually even hearing me, hopefully? I guess I don't quite understand maybe how, the, how controlling Nebulosity with focus, focus max I mean, what what is the advantage of just using Focus Max to control the camera? Yeah, so right. Focus Focus Max has a very limited uh, range of cameras it supports. It supports ASCOM cameras. So let's say you have your Canon digital SLR. No ASCOM driver for that. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Let's go and actually deal that. So there are a lot of cameras that don't have ASCOM drivers yet, and any of those you could actually do with this. In addition, you can go in the opposite direction as well. So you can be running things inside of Nebulosity and then be able to tell Focus Max to go and do things, etc. So it opens up a lot of flexibility for you. One of these days, I hope to have a more streamlined version of autofocusing actually going that doesn't require a purchase of a full Focus Max, but that's something that's still uh, decidedly in the works and not, uh, um, not even yet in, in solid enough development to actually be talking about yet. But hopefully that gets baked in at, uh, at some point soon down the line. How about the ASCOM mount control? Do you have any plans to build mount control into Nebulosity? Yeah, that's the kind of thing that I could very, very easily add into something like, uh, um, like the scripting language and a little toolbox kind of thing here, where I could tell it, okay, look, you know, tell your ASCOM mount to go to this spot or, and this kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that what I want is input from users and the community in terms of suggested features. You know, for a long time, lots and lots of suggestions for features and everything coming in because there was still a lot of things, there were still a lot of things actually to add. These days those have trickled down a whole bunch because we've got a lot now baked into this. But if there is something out there that I just don't happen to be using, I mean, for one thing, look, I'm on a Mac. I, this is this window here, this is a little virtual machine. And inside this virtual machine is where all of my development actually for Nebulosity happens. It all runs on, you know, on a Mac. Um, so I'm not out there running ASCOM and this kind of thing all that often, but if that's something that folks would actually really want to have, shoot me an email so I don't forget it, and yeah, let's try to figure out exactly how that's going to work. Plate solving is one of the next big ones to actually get in here. Yeah. So we'll be able to take yeah, it. The first thing you have to have for plate solving is the mount control, right? So well, it depends. It depends on exactly what you want to end up having out of this. There is the aspect of being able to say, okay, what, what image is this here? You can use plate solving, and that's obviously without it. You can also be using plate solving to actually figure out what your translation and rotation and scaling are across images. So you can go through and say, hey, look, where is this image? And now I know actually how to align it, or at least get a very good starting initial alignment so that you can have frames taken even in montages across different nights and be able to register and align their portions on top of each other intelligently. So there are a couple of uses even before the mount control. But you're right, obviously, for, uh, you know, go to this spot or go to the same spot I was last night and this kind of thing, that sort of thing works out very nicely. Could you describe a little bit, you've got this, got a feature for registering images with, uh, uh, in, for the purpose of framing with the oh, yeah. or whatever? Yeah, so this way... That? This was the thing that I added. This was actually in version 0.1. It was one of the very first features I ever added to Nebulosity. 
Um, so let's say you've got you know some some image here. This is the image that I happen to have taken, say last night of this star field, and I want to be able to line up between nights. And if I do something like I have to focus here, you know what we'll see is okay. Look, here's my little star field, and I could try to do something like say, okay, look, let me try to align these across nights. But the question is, how do I see if these things are actually on top of each other? Easy way to do this is your image from one night. Say, quote, last night here. And I say, all right, here's my image from last night. Let me now go through and bin this image. In fact, let me do, uh, yeah, it's four by four. Um, try to make this the way it was the night before. And the easiest way to do this is just to say, OK, look, let me now go and bin this one. So I'm going to call this model. This is what I had last night. And now I can include them in my lay down just with the right mouse on up to three different stars in this image. So now when I say, let me go and do frame and focus, I can now actually go and slide my mount so that these stars end up on the crosshairs. So that if it means, oh, move a little north, move a little south, of course, as I move my mount, these stars will move up and down and left and right, and you can get these to line up across nights perfectly. So it's a very, very simple way of actually getting it so that these things are on top of each other. And if you don't use previews, you just use standard preview, you can do that same kind of thing. Say, like, oh, here's a nice bright star, or here's a bright star, and here's a bright star. This is, I loaded up last night's shot. I laid down the markers on here. Now let me see where am I tonight. Hit preview again. Now in this little simulator, there is no motion in between them, and so nothing is coming up here. But now we would end up moving them out until they line up on top of each other, So they line up on top of those little markers. It, when I run it, it takes me just a couple minutes or whatever each night to get things to line up perfectly on top of the previous night. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Craig, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. There's uh, a lot of this here. Have you ever considered a polar alignment tool? Ah, so a polar alignment tool. Um, to me, this was one of the great successes of uh, PhD2. So, I wrote PhD many years ago, again, to just sort of be very, very simple for people to use and very powerful. And there came a time and a point at which trying to actually support PhD with all the things that could get added into it and would be interesting and also support the and have a family and a full time job was just getting to be a bit too much. And around about that time, another programmer had approached me to say, hey, would you mind? You know, I, you've released PhD as open source, and that's that's great. Would you mind if I start doing a little bit of work on it? Because I'd really like to add adaptive optics. I said, great, go for it. And in the process, he started down a path of actually going and rewriting the code, uh, refactoring the code in a massive, massive uh, push through to clean everything up, and set it up so that other programmers could go through and add in new features to PhD too. It's a wonderful, wonderful community. And one of the things that's gotten added into PhD2 a little while ago is a really, really nice polar alignment routine. And because it's PhD that actually already has all of the information that you need to be able to actually go and solve the polar alignment. It knows where the stars move as a function of right ascension and declination. It knows how much. It knows, so therefore, the image scale. And by sitting here and just watching a star loop over time and tracking its drift, which it does, because that's how it figures out, in fact, of course, how to send its corrections, it now knows exactly the way that you're drifting. And so it can then say, hey, tell you what, uh, yeah, aim a little bit further south, and then go and watch it again. So it has a really, really nice automatic, uh, well, semi-automated um, polar alignment routine built into it. It's always going to have to be semi-automated, you know, semi because unless you have something like a paramount, you don't have motorized controls over the you know, altitude and azimuth here on your mount. And so, all right, you know, most of us don't have that, so it's semi-automated. But it's built into PHD version 2 right now, and it works really nicely. I've used it myself.
Are you still there? We are. I'm muting in between questions because I'm being told uh, I'm getting a bad echo. Are there any other questions from the audience? All right, then I'm going to ask my favorite question, and that has nothing to do with nebulosity, but what cool toys are you working with on your bench? So, right, I was asked last time that question. I've got to try to find where is the Google window here because I wanted to show you. Last time I was asked um, that, I said I usually have a bunch of cameras around here. And I said I had a bunch of cameras, but this time I wanted to actually show you what, what I actually had to, to try to demo here. Now, you've already seen my, my normal camera, the, the QSI 540 here. I do like that one a lot. Um, and my guide camera often is a little Starlight Express Lodestar here. It happens to be hooked up on something. And uh, in addition then, well, down here, let me see if I can pull this up, is a, uh, um, a QHY9. And I better pick up the pace on this because here's a ATIC, here's a little QSI uh, 5 to L and here's a Q. Little one and another one and a ATIC 16 and a um, QHY 8 Pro and a Me DSI and a Starlight Express and a fish camp starfish and uh, imaging systems TIS and I forget who made this one um, and an optic star and I think that's about it for right now. Oh, oh of course and a uh, Canon digital SLR and um, yeah that's about 18 or so cameras actually uh, 15 or so cameras on the desk here right now. Um, so that's kind of one of the perks, I guess, of, uh, of this is that you have a lot of cameras. The downside is that they typically are things like, well, this is clearly not a production unit here, um, and you get the base model of things to write for because the more expensive ones tend to operate like the base ones. But, um, yeah, there are, there are lots and lots of them around. The down, other downside is then the ability to actually get out and, and use them, which unfortunately is a little challenging these days, but I do get out every once in a while. You saw I've had that, that uh, wide field shot of Orion. I have full LRGB data, hydrogen alpha data, S2 and O3 data, and one of these years I'm going to make a really, really nice shot out of it. Hopefully, well, more like one of these weeks or months, I'm finally going to get a chance to put that all together. So those are the uh, camera toys here. And this, by the way, this one I'm pretty proud of. You may not actually know this. This is the this is the what ended up being the QHY5 slash the Orion Starshoot Auto Guider. Um, this camera came about back in the days of SAC imaging. I mentioned that you know started with the webcams and that sort of thing. My first camera I bought was one of those webcams that I hacked, and then the next one was a SAC8. If anybody ever needs parts for a SAC8 camera, I have like a box full of parts for uh, SAC8 and SAC10 cameras. I need more SAC-10 cameras, actually. Um, in any case, this was uh, back, obviously, in uh, uh, some early, early days, and I was lamenting the fact that the field didn't have an inexpensive auto-guider. People were doing things like buying me DSIs, two of them, one to use as the auto-guider and the other to use as their main camera, and that's not great, and the webcams aren't, you know, they can work as auto-guiders, but they're color and they're not ideal, and they don't have nice little guide ports on the back of them. And so I was lamenting the fact that the field didn't have this. And so I sat down and started combing through spec sheets and this kind of thing and said, you know what? If we just use this really inexpensive Micron MT9001 chip, that really actually has all of the control electronics and everything built onto it, a simple little USB controller, an opto-isolator to give you the ST4 output, and you've got a guide camera. It's a mono guide camera. It's got a decent sized chip. It's got a guide port output, and the whole thing can be done really, really inexpensively. So I pitched the idea to SAC Imaging, told them that they should do this. They pitched it to QHY. That became the QHY5 and the Starshoot Auto Guider. 
their uh, uh, Orion's first uh, main guide camera and everything there. So all of those cameras and everything that folks got to use, they weren't perfect, but inexpensive, worked reasonably. All they need to do is be able to guide an image and everything there. Started back from that uh, that conversation there with the uh, 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 with the folks at SAC, and then uh, with Qui at uh, QHY at QHY Imaging, and then uh, Orion got involved to be able to actually uh, uh, nicely market them and all that kind of thing, and that's the history on that. So, any other questions or anything for tonight? What about the optics that you use? It looks like mostly camera lenses. Is that right? Or no, no. So actually, my you know, I've got a bunch of scopes. Um, I've got a, uh, a Celestron C8 carbon fiber guy that I keep threatening to take this guy here, which has a nice big APS size chip on him there, and is the exact there and have an 8 inch F2, you know, camera. I haven't done that yet, um, but I keep threatening to do it. I live in light polluted skies in Southern California, as you guys do, and so RGB imaging from in the backyard and everything isn't so great. So you see, I do a lot of line filter work. Um, so, but in any case, the uh, I've got that that gets a little bit of use. I've actually got an Orion UK Newtonian f4.5 that gets a little bit of use. The one that gets though the lion's share of the use is my Borg. I have a four-inch Borg telescope, uh, a Borg 101 uh, EDF4. They no longer make that exact model, um, but it's the one that I use. I can run it at f4. I run it at uh, or at f5.6. It's got a really nice flat field connect, um, across the uh, whole setup there. Full, you can do 35 millimeter frames if you want on the uh, certainly on the 5.6 uh, with it still being perfectly flat. And actually, the f4 even works really nicely on that too. It's fantastic. Really, really like it. Um, I got a question here and from uh, Dave. Have you been able to develop a Mac interface to the newer S big cameras, like the newer STT and STL images? Imagers, uh, I didn't know that it was an issue. Um, what that's going to come down to? S big has a wonderful driver. They have a fantastic programmer that's written a wonderful driver for them that works on uh, Windows, works on Macs, and actually works on Linux as well. And so what it's going to come up to is uh, contact me offline here. It's really just going to come down probably to updating the um, uh, updating the version of the SBIG library that I have bundled into things in uh, uh, in the velocity on the Macs. Macs work a little differently than Windows in terms of things like cameras. Windows, you install your own drivers and all this. Um, that doesn't happen on Macs. Things get baked into the uh, the programs themselves, and so uh, it looks like I just need to update um, update the Mac framework to their uh, to their later thing to support it there. But should be able to work there just fine. As I say, fantastic stuff. Great cameras, fantastic software interface on SBIG stuff there. And I really wish I could actually nicely get at the two sensors, one in nebulosity and one in PhD, but it's uh, just not really all that feasible, I'm afraid. Um, I have a question. Um, the QHY now making a you know, the guiding camera with the cooling right now. Yeah. Do you see any advantage of the cooling such a guiding camera? It depends a lot on the chip that you're using, um, and you know your actual conditions and this sort of thing there. So some of the chips do pretty well without cooling, uh, but even like the the classic you know QHY5 slash Orion Auto Guider camera there. You know, you start getting into a couple second long exposures, and if you've got to be pulling that sort of thing to be able to pick up your guide star, yeah, you're getting a whole bunch of thermal noise and everything on there. So this really comes down to how the individual guide chip behaves. Uh, other sensors, you know, the uh, Sony sensors baked into um, like the uh, the Lodestar and everything there, and the the Lodestar 2, far less in the way of dark current. In fact, actually, the QHY 52L does very, very nicely on that uh, as well in terms of the dark current. So that's going to come down a lot to the individual chip that they're using. And then if you're doing something like if you are guiding with an off-axis guide, really faint guide star that you can only get in a five second or so exposure. Your mount may be able to pull the five seconds and everything between connections just between corrections just fine, and so okay, yeah, yeah, you're going to need a long exposure to be able to pull that off and pull out that faint star. 
But for a lot of us, it's not really going to make a whole bunch of difference here. But for some of us, definitely it would make a, a, a big kind of thing there. So I would take a look at your own rig and see, OK, look, are you having any kinds of uh, issues in terms of being able to pull out a guide star with a one or two second exposure? And if you are, all right, yeah, no, then go take a look at that. Bigger sensors, obviously, also as well. Um, the bigger your guide sensor, the better. And you know there are huge benefits to running with an all-access guide kind of setup. I do that routinely. Um, the rig I held up on the QSI there doesn't happen to have it because I can't get that lens um, to reach focus when I also have the off-axis guider in there. But my main rig, that Borg F4, I run with the off-axis guider. Um, but it's such a wide field, I pick up 20 stars like a guy uh, pretty darn easily. Anything else there? Thank you. Uh, Craig, um, do you have an opinion about uh, guiding through ST4 versus guiding through ASCOM? Yeah. My opinion is it really doesn't matter. Way, way, way back in the day, it mattered. Um, so back when, back when this was probably your camera, it mattered. Because the way the guiding worked at that point through ASCOM is you would say, oh, turn on the mount going east at guide rate, and then the program would start counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, whatever. But of course, it's more like, you know, one hundredth of a second, you know, and this kind of thing. And then, oh, turn it off. And if you do that, start, wait, turn off, you have to have three commands at minimum to be able to pull that off. The problem was that the little hand controllers at the time might listen for commands once every quarter second. So if you're going to send a 300 millisecond guide pulse, go. Quarter second, is there a command? Why no, there isn't. Because it's a little bit longer than a quarter of a second. Another quarter second goes by, is there a command? Oh, yes, now there's a command saying stop. All right, well, in that time there, I've now done a half a second worth of a guide, expo a guide correction where I really only wanted like 300 milliseconds. So that was a huge problem. And then along came the very bright idea of, well, why are we sending commands that are so stupid? Um, let's actually do this thing that is gone by the name of pulse guiding. Um, I believe I believe it was the, was it BISC who started that? I, don't quote me on that. I know now it's live, it's streamed on YouTube. So who, if I got that wrong, my apologies. In any case, but the basic idea then was to send a single command that said guide east for 300 milliseconds. And so it would get that one command, and internally it would clock out the 300 milliseconds and stop it. So back in the days of the Mead LXD 55s and the Celestron CG 5s, the initial like go tos and all that kind of thing, back around those days, that's when this came into play. And since then, if you have a mount that's at least that kind of vintage, they all have this nice packaged kind of format. So it really doesn't matter. If you have an old mount, I used to have a TAC EM10, beautiful, beautiful mount. I think it listened for commands once every five seconds. Okay, it wasn't that bad, but it was almost that bad, so you had to go through the ST4. Good reason to do it there. Finally, if you're trying to have multiple programs talk to the mount at the same time through ASCOM, it can be a little bit easier to go and say, okay, look, let's just have my planetarium program talk to ASCOM. We'll have PhD talk to the ST4 thing, and everything will be just just fine. Um, if you don't do that, some ASCOM drivers let you go through and actually have two things connected at once. If they don't, you can use something called the POTH in ASCOM. And I remember when it finally dawned on me that stands for Plain Old Telescope Hub. OK, so this then is a thing that you connect to the hub in PhD. Your planetarium program talks to the hub. And this hub, which is just a software little interface, is the thing that actually talks to the mount and sends each of the commands in there. So with that, you can mitigate this whole problem of having to deal with, uh, with things. Finally, of course, if you're on a Mac, you're not running ASCOM, so you're running an SD4 kind of thing. Um, I have had stuff in, uh, in here to be able to talk to some other packages, like Equinox Image, um, and this kind of thing to be able to you know, get it so that you don't have to go through the SD4 on there. I don't know if anybody in the world has ever actually used that. Uh, I used it for a little while, but then I stopped. So um, really, in the, at the end of the day, these days, it's not going to matter in the slightest with any mount that's less than a decade old. And even then... Greg? Yeah. So then I think CJ, like, I use the IOPTOL mount. 
And then mm-hmm. actually sometimes you can start to say the new firmware are supporting like you know the guiding with PEC, P PEC connection. So in that case, if you I don't I need to confirm with diopter, but if you send ASCOM command, so the, you know the computer and the mount can understand how long they need to you know, compensate. So it might be work better in that way. It's this basic question of what happens if PEC is sending a command and at the same time you're getting a guide command and everything to come in. Um, that ends up actually typically not being an issue. Um, I don't know on the Ioptron mount specifically, so you'd have to you'd have to ask them if that ends up being an issue. But I do know on other mounts that simultaneously, uh, I mean, that have PEC and have guiding going simultaneously, that the PEC curve is just being constantly played into the motors, and so your error will obviously will hopefully be less, but still when it gets that other command. Because what the what the PEC thing is doing is it's actually speeding up and slowing down the pulses that are actually going to the motor. That's going along its merry way, and at the same time, you can send something saying, oh, increase the speed by this little bit, and it just adds it on top of whatever is on there already. It shouldn't be a big deal for their software. Around it by having things. That said, I have... You know, my mount, I've got an Ioptron uh, mount and all this kind of thing. I've got a Gemini mount that has PEC. Um, I don't use it because PHD just goes and does its thing and doesn't really seem to care about whether the periodic error is in there or not. If you've got huge amounts, I suppose it would be a reasonable thing and everything to run on there, but you should still be able with any kind of reasonable sampling rate to be able to pull out the uh, error regardless of whether you've got PEC going on or not. Um, if you are, if you have a lot of error and you're having to do very long exposures, PEC is going to help you. But otherwise, personally, I don't even bother with it. Uh, in terms of, oh, so another question that's come in by chat here. Uh, uh, what's my take on the new uh, um, XISF image format being touted by the PixInsight developers? Um, I'm all, I mean... There are, there, there's, you know, we've had fits for a good long time, um, and it's a nice standard. Um, at the same time, there are things that are not at least transparently built into, uh, built into fits that, you know, could be cured with other, with other formats. So, I mean, PixInsight, uh, the folks there are very, very keen on things like being able to keep track of your actual color space settings and this kind of thing. And one could come up with a format to stick that inside of fits. I know that they've been working. I actually haven't taken a look at uh, uh, the current incarnation of things. I will, you know, when there's something out there that's ready to be supported, um, I will readily support a new format here. Because again, from my point of view, in, in writing Nebulosity, one of the things I wanted to have baked into this is easy interoperability with other packages. Um, I don't want you to be locked into just my software. I don't use just my software. I use my stuff. I use PixInsight. PixInsight's great. It's got all sorts of really, really insanely cool advanced tools to be able to actually, well, do some great processing and everything to your images. So why wouldn't I use it? I use Photoshop. Yeah, I use all of these things. And so we want to be able to have a nice packages, nice formats that have things go back and forth nice and cleanly. Um, uh, TIFF is solid. It, though, is kind of clunky to end up working with. I happen to like 16-bit PNGs, but, again, there's a lot of information that's tough to manage in the header and this kind of thing. And so new format, sure. Absolutely all about it. I'll easily incorporate it into the software here. In fact, uh, when I got off here today, I'll go take a look at where the current standard is and see if it's ready to actually be implemented. It's not going to be a problem. So anything else? Um, how about multi-star guiding in PHD? That seems to be a popular one in Maxim that rears its ugly head. Yeah, so um, multi-scar guiding was something that I had planned, and I figured out the interface and all this sort of thing for. And then I went and I actually, and I have the utmost respect, actually, um, for the, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name right now. So in any case, uh, multi-star guiding 
I was all set to go and implement this kind of thing. And actually, right now, uh, I do know that it's in, at the very least, it's in the development branch of uh, PhD2. Um, but I had all st the complete intention of sticking it into PhD1. And then I said, OK, what is it actually going to do for me? Can I go through and actually replicate some of the data I've seen collected on the benefits of, of multi-star guiding? So I went and I took a whole bunch of images and took all of these guide frames, saved all of the guide frames, and started analyzing these to then try to figure out exactly what I would gain by working with multiple stars as a guide. And the answer was um, nothing. On all of my test data, I couldn't come up with anything that ended up actually being a reasonable um, benefit that I would have gotten from the multi-star guiding. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people who clearly benefit from multi-star guiding, because there are. What it comes down to is that in my skies, I don't have that. So what really is happening here, when you need multi-star guiding is, let's say you, you've got your stars here, and if this is what's happening, you don't need multi-star guiding, because all of the stars are moving together in synchrony. If you have some turbulence go through that does this to your image, you do need multi-star guiding. Because if you're locked on to just one of them here and it does this, well, maybe it's just this part of the image that's done it, and the whole rest of the image is perfectly fine. And so what you should do is take a look at a bunch of these here and try to figure out on average where is the image moved. But the wind kind of got out of my sails when I went through and I figured out that in none of my stuff would it actually do anything because I don't live probably on something like the side of a mountain, where you'd be getting these kind of thermal currents and everything that would be doing it. Like you guys, I live near the ocean. And we get a fairly laminar flow coming off of the ocean and all this kind of thing, and so it just wasn't going to do anything. And so even my ability to go and test and see exactly what is it doing and how much is it improving and to make some great image that I could say, see, look at this cool graph and how much better it's gotten with the multi-star and everything, wouldn't have done anything. And so I, that was one of the things that was left on my list of things to do, and I had just been taking a look in PhD, uh, um, in PhD2, which honestly, uh, and the whole crew there has been working on for a good long time, even without me, um, and it's uh, uh, been doing absolutely fantastic kinds of uh, uh, kinds of stuff without any of my intervention here, even for a little while. But I have seen uh, some of the stuff in the commits here talking about multi-star guiding, so I know that's at least in the uh, in the works here. Greg, do you know that anybody who's working on AO beyond the simple tip-tilt uh, systems that are available to the amateurs? Yes, yes. There are folks that are working on some of these kinds of things because, um, you know, the idea... Uh, let me just see here, just see if any of the... No, okay, it's not in the, uh, the full commits here, just in the developmental stuff. Because, right, in... You know, when you're guiding your mount, you're doing translations in each direction. Great. The tip tilt does translations in each direction, but it can do it much faster than you can do. You can make your big heavy mount react. Um, where people are going that I have, I've heard folks talking about is instead of talking about trying to actually have a, um, like an observatory grade deformable sort of mirror, um, which is going to be very, very expensive, um, trying to actually look more at things like the light field kinds of cameras. I've heard a number of people talking about this. I'm not at liberty to sort of share their, their kinds of uh, thoughts in any, in any detail, but I have heard of a number of folks working on the idea. So these light field cameras, like the uh, Lightos was the uh, um, first one that, that came out, maybe the only one that's actually on the market right now. But the idea is instead of having a single sensor that has a grid of pixels, and regardless of the direction of the light, what we capture is, while I was open, how many photons happened to hit me? So what is the intensity here? What you capture is the vector. Also then, well, OK, well, we got it. You know, well, we know that it came in here, so we capture. There were a whole bunch coming from this way and some coming from this way, et cetera which then enables you in software to change the focus point. And so you can imagine it's a pretty quick leap to then go say, OK, look, if we can post hoc change the focus point and the depth of field here, 
what I could be doing is I could say, okay, look, let me have this part of the frame be in focus here and this part of the frame be in focus back here. So I'm in fact constantly going through and changing which part of the field depth here I'm having be in focus. And if you can do that, you don't need all sorts of fancy stuff to be able to distort a mirror in real time to deal with this kind of thing. You actually just collect the whole light field data and sort it out afterwards and then be able to say, oh, let's do this. And by the way, I don't want that coma to exist. Yeah, that, that should be gone too. And let me take care of other optical defects like that at the same time. So the problem is SNR in these kinds of devices and this sort of thing, but this is, to me, where I see the, uh, um, the field actually going on that. It would be really cool. Any other questions? Could you do that with the light field cameras that are out there? There's one commercial, uh, commercial one out there for the amateur for uh, terrestrial photography. Lito, I think it is. Yeah, exactly. That's that Lito's camera. Right. And so. You know, there are some issues with just slapping it in place of an eyepiece and running on it, but I, I have heard of, and I, the reason why I can say this is that, you know, one of them was speaking up at a talk I just gave to the whole audience and all that sort of thing, so I don't mind uh, at least saying that I know that folks are, are working on this exact sort of solution to the, uh, to the problem to try to use some of these same kinds of approaches, these light field style approaches to try to solve that. And if that can actually hit and become something that could be marketed for folks like us, that's a that's a massive game changer. That'll be as big of a change as we had going from film to CCD. That'd be really cool. But it's gonna require substantial optics, right? I mean No. no but but for, to get to the signal of noise that you need. So the, the point actually in those in the cameras is you're not doing the distortions. You do all the just you know compensate for the distortions and everything in software afterwards, because you know you don't just have the observation of boom something hit here. You say something hit here and it came in this way. You get that full vector of the uh, um, you know of the data, and so you have you have the information then to be able to solve that and pull it back out and be able to say that, okay, look, my field should have been nice and flat, but it wasn't. These things that should have been nice parallel rays came in like this, so let's pretend that they were parallel rays and bring them out that way. Um, so it's all in the sensor and in the software, which is pretty fantastic. Now, there may need to be things in terms of image amplification that leads before this and this kind of deal, but that's I do know that that is a field that, that folks are working on. Right. Any other questions? We'll turn up the lights here a little. So you can see us saying, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and your expertise and your great software. Well, sure thing. And I uh, hope to see you.